There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hey, welcome everybody once again to another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms, and I've got sitting off my right shoulder, which is unusual because usually sitting across from me. Uh, but Mike McGrady's here. What's up, Dave? How you doing, Mike? Never been better. I, and that's uh, that's throw my me usual. With that. That's your usual. <laughs> you threw me with that. You haven't come, no, you haven't I'm done good. that in a while. Okay, because since the last time we aired an episode, you and I went dove hunting. Right, we took our youngest daughter's dove hunting, and we got we caught more mosquitoes than we did yeah, doves. Yeah, didn't say dove shooting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah, but as far as shooting goes, I got to take the family on uh, Memorial Day weekend over to, or no, Labor Day weekend. Sorry, um, over to Nebraska to the Wildcat Hills uh, State Recreation Area. So their game and fish over there have a site in which they put in a whole new shooting range, and I just really want to put a plug in for it because it's awesome. There's, there's long gun, there is pistol. Indoors, they have uh, like pellet guns and traditional shoot a target. And then they have this huge metal display that's your old fashioned gallery. You can shoot down the targets that get set back up. It's got whirling things, it's stuff that moves. And, uh, and then they also have an archery range in which they have 3D targets and regular targets and completely economical for a family to go. They had miniature bows that my eight-year-old daughter who's left-handed could shoot and they gave and, and it was part of the price and it, it was perfect i think we were there for two hours shot 400 pellets at least among the family of four uh, bows arrows everything and it was we got out of there for like 36 bucks or something can't even do a movie for that no you can't it was perfect and so if you're ever going to be in the i guess scott's bluff area if you're going to go check out the bluff that is a place to stop and go it's, it's something that should be rewarded where a state park and recreation group has come together for shooting sports oh that's pretty neat we could yeah. use, we could use something like that in this area you know you and i sometimes go out to our local uh, uh city range that's right archery range yeah. yeah it's great i mean it's great it's free mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it, but it's hay bales and about this time of year those hay bales are pretty well shot out that's right. <laughs> everybody's yeah. sighting in for yeah. uh, for the fall archery hunt yeah and i got to use that recurve bow i let me mention that we had a listener help me Help me with that. So I'm improving on that. Got to shoot at some 3D targets and actually got to shoot a baboon and a T-Rex. And it so, was fun. So next year when you and I go out elk hunting. During I'm, no, I'm season, bringing the comp phone. Oh. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to take the recurve. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe you were going to give me no. a competitive advantage uh, by yeah. taking the recurve. Well, speaking of recurves and, and, uh, and who I got it from. Yeah. We got a guest. We do. First, we don't have Nephi. That's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Nephi bailed on us. Yeah. He decided that he would go to uh, Connecticut and shoot clay pigeons all day. Um, which isn't a bad thing to do, no. I suppose. No. Uh, in Connecticut, do you have to actually, though, check your firearm out and I don't return know. it back to where you got it from before you can shoot the clay I said, pigeons? oh, you went to the former gun state. Yeah. <laughs> gun manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. he's missing out. Yes. Let's just say he's missing out today. He'll be missed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we'll probably, in the next few minutes, forget that he was you know, ever part of this. Uh, no offense, Nephi. Yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're really excited about our, uh, our guest this evening. Um, I, I think the easiest way, well, I want to, I want to first of all say thank you to uh, our guest uh, who is United, Sa United States Senator uh, from Wyoming, Senior Senator from Wyoming, Mike Enzi. Thank you for spending time with us today. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, I get to work on a lot of things for uh, people who like the outdoors. And uh, it's not my major task, but uh, it's something I get to work on all the time because uh, there's so many people that don't understand the outdoors. Yeah. I've been the uh, chairman of the Sportsman's Caucus, which is where we try and get people from the House and the Senate more interested in the outdoor sports. And so we have some uh, uh, fishing events that we do and some shooting events that we do. And uh, that's kind of unique in the capital. For the fishing events, we bring in some uh, top-notch fly fishing experts and have them uh, kind of teach fly fishing on the lawn of the Capitol. 
I got to, I got to do that one year. Yeah, when I was I was working on the hill, Lefty Cray taught me how to cast, and that five minutes I spent with him shaved ten years of frustration off of my life. (laughs) (laughs) Although when Lefty Cray coaches you, he yells a lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. But but has really good instruction and can demonstrate really well, and he's one of the big names in in fly fishing. But they they get the instruction one day, and then the next day we go down on the Potomac River. And we try and pick it when the shad run is happening there. So it's fish coming in out of the ocean, fresh and feisty. And uh, they have guides for the people and get to fish. And uh, one year we hit the peak of the shad run. And we had house members who didn't go back to work. (laughs) They didn't go to vote. They just stayed there. We were catching five or six an hour. What were you catching? Shad. Oh, just, okay. Yeah, Yeah, really a powerful football-shaped fish, but real... Real slender. Sometimes when I hear shad, I you know they're thought of as a bait fish in a lot of places. Oh yeah, the, those are little little ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. 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 But no, here these are, these are about a foot and a half, two foot long. Oh boy, they're nice, nice, nice fish. And if people have their kids with them up on the canal, uh, the towpath on the canal, they close off part of that and stock it with bluegills and bass and that sort of thing. And the kids get to fish up there. Oh yeah, and the... that's a way to hook them on the sport. Oh. <clears throat> So you're already so, so you're doing your part to recruit the next generation into yes uh, yes yes and maybe and some that, of the current generation yeah. yeah and at the Sporting Clays Range we also do an archery uh, event and a number of the big archery companies bring their semis in and help fit people with bows and they set up uh, targets and uh, one of the targets that they set up was a, was actually an elk that would run across a clearing and you could try and shoot at the elk while it's running across the clearing. And uh, Craig Thomas's chief of staff was there and decided that he wanted to try a crossbow, and they let him. And so this elk comes running across there. He's never hunted elk before. He shoots a crossbow and hits it in the heart <laughs> <laughs> on a running elk. And they said, well, would you like to try that again? Now, most people would say, no, I can never do better than that. He said, yeah, I'd like to do that again. So they load him up again. They move the elk back. They spring it again as it comes running across there. He fires again, and he splits his first arrow. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and he still didn't buy the crossbow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. So how, so. Many, how many members of Congress participate in, in uh, the Sportsman Caucus? Um, or or events. There there are a lot more signed up for it than ever participate okay. on the sporting clays. Uh, I was usually the only senator that showed up for the shooting there, which meant that I won the senator trophy for <laughs> yeah, right. being the best shot. <laughs> and of course, I felt compelled to go back and be on the floor of the Senate and say, uh, you know, I'm the best shot in the Senate. I, we just had this big competition and I won it. <laughs> At which point, Senator Harkin came to the floor and said, no, you're not the best shot in the Senate. I am the best shot in the Senate. And I said, you know, 50% of everything is just showing up. And you didn't show up. <laughs> I don't think he ever came to that event. But, uh, yeah. so. No, that's that's uh, that's a neat. I mean, that's a neat story. That's it's uh, it's fun that things like to know that things like that are actually happening in mm-hmm. our nation's capital with members of Congress. And uh, uh, how? Let me ask you. Go back in time a little bit. Uh, so you've been you've been in the Senate now for how how many years? For twenty two years. Twenty two years. Yep. Yeah, twenty-two and a half, I guess. What What made you decide to run for the Senate? Um, I wasn't going to run for the Senate. I wasn't ever going to be in politics. When I graduated from college, I was going to get a master's degree, and and the university offered me a scholarship. It just had one little clause in there that gave me heartburn, that said that I would have to uh, be in government at some point in my life. It could be on a part-time basis, but two years. And so I wrote a six-page thank you note because I appreciated them making the offer, but said that my parents taught me that if you're not going to fulfill an obligation, you shouldn't sign up for it. So I turned that down. Now I've had 40 years in government. Um, But Senator Simpson talked me into running for mayor of Gillette when we were new to Gillette, and it was just starting up in the the first boom. And uh, I really enjoyed doing that. I learned a lot and got to do a blueprint for how that town could grow into the future, and that felt pretty good. But I got out of politics. And so then sp- you, you were out like thirty 
when you ran for mayor? Or? I was 29. 29, and, and yeah. the town had three paved streets, four paved streets, <laughs> and then it got a boom while you were mayor, right? It, it and, did, yeah. And well, boom, I, we're I talking. Got, I got to do the uh, significant boom. negotiations yeah. with the oil companies that did the 13 coal mines for their industrial siting to make sure that we'd have some things that would uh, make the city good and that their yeah. employees would like to live in. Uh, they were really under no obligation to do that, but uh, yeah, we, so we you, got them you, to do you it. managed the the city that had one of it, it's the energy capital. Uh, uh, we say yeah, the we world. had we had oil, yeah. natural gas, we had coal bed methane, we had yeah. the coal, and a lot of the uranium comes from Campbell County too. So um, I had to convince the people that they needed to get ready for <clears throat> for the growth, and uh, suggested that they didn't have to. But if they didn't, we we're having an energy crisis already. We'd already been cut off from Saudi, by Saudi Arabia before and said that we needed to get uh, energy sufficient. And they said, if we don't get ready for it, they're just going to run over us. And so I had a lot of people that pitched in and helped. And uh, most of the people that come to a boom town are young people. And the great thing about young people is they don't know what can't be done. They haven't already had some bad experiences and said, oh, no, no, we tried that back in 42 and it didn't work. Uh, you throw out an idea there and they decide it can be done. I had some great experiences with that. <clears throat> I had one group of young people come and see me and they said, you know, it's just not right that kids have to be incarcerated with adults. And this was before the federal government figured that out. <laughs> and um, I said, so what are you going to do? They said, oh, we're going we're gonna to buy a house and we're going to hire some house parents and they'll take the kids when they come into custody and they'll make sure that they show up for any of the uh, any of the trials or anything they have to have and, and watch over them. I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. What do you want the city to do? And they were shocked. They said, oh, we didn't want the city to do anything. We just thought we needed to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks later, they had bought the house and hired the parents. And today, that's uh, that takes care of all of northeast Wyoming with uh, with kids that need to be incarcerated. So. A lot of a lot of great experiences. I didn't. I ran on having a balanced budget and uh, an agenda at council meetings. I'm an accountant, so the balanced budget part was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I didn't know then that I had to know about uh, streets and sidewalks and sewer and water and and uh, landfills and police and fire protection and all of the other things that happen in a municipality. I also didn't know there's no such thing as a good answer to snow removal. <laughs> <laughs> had some nasty letters to the editor written. We didn't have any equipment to handle it anyway. Just uh, nobody's figured that out yet. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Everybody's figured it out except the people in charge of the snow removal. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's true. That's true. I used to keep a snow shovel in my car because when we'd have a storm, I'd get these calls and they'd say, you know, the darn city just blocked in my driveway and my car and... And uh, I'm really, really ticked. I want to know what you're going to do about it. I said, well, give me a few minutes. So I'd go out and drive to their place and get my snow shovel out of the car. And I'd be out there digging their, digging their driveway out. And they'd come out and say, oh, no, I didn't expect you to do it. I'd say, well, everybody else is doing snow removal. <laughs> I never got a call twice from the same people. <laughs> but if you, if you plow it to the sides, you're going to block cars in, you're going to block up driveways. But if you plow it to the center and then it freezes, nobody can make left turns. And that really irritates them too. So oh, yeah, we, yeah. we found some solutions, but nothing that everybody liked. But, but no real solutions. No, yeah. there's no such thing as a real solution <laughs> to that or animals. Yeah, right. Yeah. So then you, you went from uh, mayor to... Being in the state legislature. State legislature. Yeah. There were a bunch of municipal problems that I thought I could help solve down there. So I, I ran for the legislature and got elected to the House. How, old, course, were you, I, how were, old were you when you were elected to the legislature for the first time? Let's see, 39. Yeah. So I uh, <clears throat> um, asked to be on the Corporations Committee because that's the committee that handles all of the municipal stuff. And... Uh, what I discovered, though, is if you actually have experience at something in a legislative body, you're suspect because you're biased. <laughs> <laughs> so I got some things through, but it wasn't very satisfying. So I, the next time when 
I got reelected. I said, I, I want to be on a different committee. And uh, I did get on a different committee. The main one they put me on was education. I'd never even been on a school board. So consequently, I was an expert. <laughs> and I got to make quite a few differences for the, for the education process. I, so I served five years in the House and five years in the Senate and, and really enjoyed it. Got a lot of bills passed. And then Alan Simpson decided that he wasn't going to run for United States Senate. I had just had open heart surgery. I uh, was just recovering from that. And uh, I had people that said, was that something you'd run for? My kids said that. They saw him say it on television. And I said, no, no, I'd, I'll, I'll help somebody get it. But we need somebody that's got legislative experience. And I know a lot of people that have more legislative experience than I do. I'll help one of them run. And as time went by, several of those dropped out. I got more legislators asking me to run, and I got municipalities and, and counties asking me to run. I said, no, no, I'm you know, just recovering from this heart surgery. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> and so uh, when it was too late, actually, for anybody ever to sign up, which is April before elections in November, uh, I was in church and... Uh, I was feeling sorry for myself. I hadn't gotten to hunt and fish much because of all the time I'd spent in government. And uh, so I was saying, you know, it's it's time that I got to hunt and fish. And I got this little nudge that said, I didn't keep you alive to hunt and fish. I went home in tears and said to my family, I'm, I'm running for the Senate. And we did. And the state party chairman called me and said, uh, you don't have any business running for the U.S. Senate. There's already somebody that's got a million dollars in the bank and... Uh, and he does a little thing on television almost every night that, on how to help your health. And uh, he's been in the Republican Party for a long time. So unless you want to spend 125000 on name recognition because nobody knows you, you can't get elected. I said, I don't have 125000 but I'm running anyway. So my family and I did door-to-door -door and ice cream socials and traveled all over the state. And I wound up squeaking by in the primary. And then the, the person that uh, came in second, who was able to raise money, volunteered to be my finance chairman. And uh, now is my other colleague in the United States Senate. <laughs> so you never know how things are, are going to turn out. That's the, old, that's the old Wyoming's just a small town with really long streets, right? It is. It yeah. is, yeah. Which is Governor Sullivan saying. Yeah. Uh, mine is that uh, Wyoming's still a place where you can call the wrong number and know who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yep. So it's been been an interesting journey. You but that's how, that's how I got in yeah. into politics. When, when I ran for mayor, Senator Simpson was, I was in JC's and gave a speech on leadership. And Al Simpson was the keynote speaker and did one of his humorous speeches. And then... Uh, Afterwards, he took me by the elbow over to the side, and he said, uh, you know, it's uh, time you put your money where your mouth is on this leadership stuff. You need to run for politics, and uh, that town you're in needs a mayor. So I thought about it, and driving back from Cody, I said to my wife, I, maybe I ought to run for mayor. She drove down into the borrow pit and back up again. And <laughs> we talked about what needed to be done if we wanted our kids to grow up in a really nice community. And I ran, and I got elected. Big thing against me is I was too young. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Evidently yeah. overcame it. But, you know, Gillette's uh, a, a still a vibrant community today. Well, it's it's grown dramatically. Uh, part of that's uh, water. You got to have water. Um, one of my first political things was to be on television with the mayor of Phoenix. <laughs> I got to visit with him a little before we went on the air, and uh, I asked him how Phoenix got to be so big, and he said, water. The answer is water. You have to have water. And they had concentrated on getting water, so I concentrated on getting water. I have, I think I still have an application on a project that might happen up in Montana that's been in the courts since I was mayor that would give Gillette some of the water. <laughs> really? Yeah. Which one is that? Um, I don't remember the name of it. Little, now, but little tangent it, there. Yeah, uh, right. yeah, yeah. The little bighorn. I put in for some water off the little bighorn before it flows into Montana. Yeah, there was a lot of controversy I was, I was over in, that. I was involved in um, litigation involving the Tongue and the Powder Rivers and uh, a lot of the CBM development up there. 
uh, when I was oh, yeah. when I was with the Attorney General's office. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. there was some CBM problems over on the Powder River too. There were. They they claimed that we were going to put that clean water in there and kill the mud puppies off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I remember I remember the. You know, the slight tangent, but with that case, yeah. you know, one of the, yeah. the arguments, this was the Montana v. Wyoming, Montana sued Wyoming over the Yellowstone River Compact. And mm-hmm. one of the arguments Montana was making is that you know, our CBM development was depleting the flow of the river. And in particular, they were pointing to certain years during that drought during the 2000s when we were in record drought. Uh, they said there was no water showing up at the state line. And it, <clears throat> and it was partially because, well, all of your all your irrigators were taking it, but then that CBM development was sucking it from the the river as well. Well, we ended up with experts, uh, and their experts wound up agreeing with our experts that actually during that period of time, we were augmenting the flow. We were, we were actually through the CBM development. Oh, yeah. We were actually putting water into the river uh, that Montana was benefiting from in both the Tongue and the Powder Rivers. Yeah. Uh, and that in fact, the depletion effect of it occurred over the over millennia, not over um, months or years. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, they, that argument uh, quickly uh, went away. Let's yeah, just right. put it that way. Yeah. Always it went down all, the river. It went down the river, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always lots of water problems. Uh, we also had a, a problem with keyhole drying up. Keyhole reservoir? With that drought. Yeah. 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 And uh, the water in keyhole technically belongs to South Dakota, and they take it for irrigation. But there's a certain amount to, for, that's needed for the fish that are in there, and it's it's a good fishery. And uh, we were trying to figure out how to keep the fish alive the way the water was being drawn down. And uh, so we got, we got a bill through that the, uh, what was supposed to be sediment area uh, wasn't actually being used. We didn't know that for sure, but we wanted that preserved for the fish and nobody could take it below that sediment level. And we actually got that passed and we were told that it would take uh, five to seven years of really big rainfall before that lake would fill up. And the next spring, we had a spring just like the one we've just had here, and that lake filled up to overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> so we never had to use that to get into the real controversy of the silt there. Uh, well, if you if you dealt yeah. with water, you know the old saying about water in the yes. West. You know, that, yes, it's yeah. for fighting over. <laughs> yeah, whiskey's yeah, whiskey for drinking, <laughs> and <laughs> water's for fighting. Yeah, another so, interesting project is up on the uh, um, hole in the wall. There were some ranchers up there that for se- for years have wanted some dams built in that area uh, for irrigation. And while I was mayor, um, Atlantic Richfield said they'd be willing to put a dam in up there and they'd pay for all the costs, they'd pay for all the maintenance for 20 years and, uh, and, and build it in exchange for half of the water for the 20 years. And uh, the ranchers thought that was a heck of a deal because half would be more water than they had before. Mm-hmm. And in 20 years, they'd have, have it all. Um, the environmentalists said, no, um, we need to know what that water is going to be used for. And Atlantic Richfield said, well, at the moment, we don't have any use for it. The price of oil is so low that uh, we couldn't do synthetic oil or anything, and so we don't have a use. And consequently, they never got the permit to build them. But in 1997, the water would have been all agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Middle Fork yep. Reservoir? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that project. Yep. And for for folks that are not in Wyoming, we have a lot of listeners all over the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hole in the Wall is a part of Wyoming in, in sort of north-central Wyoming. Uh, some might say northeast Wyoming. Well, we'll call it north-central. Uh, it's about the middle. It's kind of the middle. Yeah. Huh? yeah. yeah. Uh, Butch Cassidy is famous for... Uh, hole in the wall gang. Hole in the wall gang. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. There, there are some places where you can go and see where the hole in the wall gang used to hold out, and it's pretty treacherous getting down into that canyon. <laughs> yeah, I can vouch for that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys fished it? I have. I have. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's on my list, but I just haven't gotten yeah. to it. Yeah. I know some better ways to fish the same water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we could talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so. Now, now that you're in the the Senate, you you've had an opportunity to work on a variety of things, and I know um, not all of them are natural resource related because your committees have not always gone that way. But you do get issues that come up from constituents and things. And and one of the one of the more recent bills that you've been working on lately, I think, impacts a lot of hunters um, and just your average outdoorsman that likes to have a pocket knife. Um, so. 
explain the well, the bill one of the bills you're working on yeah well any any kind of a knife actually if it's legal where you are and it's legal where you're going and your plane gets diverted which happens frequently and yeah. you wind up landing in a state that doesn't have the same not, same laws your knives can be confiscated uh, the first time I ran into this was actually with a guy that sold knives and had his uh, his case of displays yeah. uh, with him. And, of course, they discovered that and impounded all of his knives. And they were pretty valuable, and he wanted them back, and we worked on the, worked on the case. But uh, the law didn't allow it. And it, it just seemed like if you, if you wind up someplace you didn't expect to be, and it's illegal to have the knives that uh, as long as you keep them in your in in the case shouldn't be any problem. Yeah. And uh I've found people on both sides of the aisle that agree with that uh, that basic logic and have joined me on the, on the bill and uh it's actually been through committee that's the first step of the process after mm-hmm. you draft a bill is to get it to go to committee and it came out unanimous on a voice vote. And uh, so now we have uh, done the next step, which is to, we call it a, a hotline, which is a telephone message goes out to see if anybody is in a, is objecting to it. And on the Republican the, the, side... The, the telephone had, calls go out to members of the, the Senate? Members of the Senate, okay. all, all at the same time. It's, it's kind of a robocall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on a special line where we're expecting those robocalls. <laughs> it's okay. Like, Okay. Not like the other other ones, and it gives us a chance to respond if we've got some kind of a difficulty with the bill. We respond at that point in time, and then the people that are the authors of the bill can get a hold of us and see what the problem is and see if there's a way to correct it. Uh, sometimes, it, usually what it is is a misunderstanding, but sometimes there's a, a, a unintended consequence that somebody knows about that they've got a suggestion for how you can solve it. And uh, that, that's the reason that we have so many people in Congress is so that we have as many backgrounds as we can have so that we can catch those unintended consequences before they turn out to be for real. And uh, so we've, we've been through that process now and we're contacting the people that, uh, um, that maybe had a difficulty with it. Uh, because it's during a recess, we think that uh, perhaps they don't know that their staff put a hold on it. <laughs> They might, but uh, they they might not too. So we'll be working on that. At the same time, uh, we'll be moving over with the House folks to see if we can't get uh, co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle for that same bill over there. Senator Wyden from Oregon, who's a, who's a Democrat, is the uh, lead co-sponsor uh, with me on on the bill, and we have a number of co-sponsors uh, from both sides of the aisle. So, again, it's one of those things that people think is just common sense. Uh, I've been through this several times before. Probably the way that that will actually pass will be an amendment on some bill that doesn't have anything to do with knives. <laughs> yeah. Because um, if you can attach it to some bill that has to pass, then people are going to vote for the bill to pass, regardless of what riders might be on there. And uh, that's the wrong way to do legislation, in my opinion. I like the Wyoming, uh, the Wyoming method, where uh, you make a fairly concise title, and then any amendments to the bill have to uh, agree with the title of the bill. And that keeps them from becoming Christmas trees and so comprehensive that nobody can comprehend them. And having so many riders on there that nobody has a chance to really sift through the riders to see, you know, what's what's real and what isn't or to debate them separately so that you can talk about those unintended consequences. Um, so that, that's where we are now. We think we can get it through the, the House as well. Um, uh, of course, when things happen with guns, that affects everything else that you can think of. Um, I have gotten uh, a bill through that allowed uh, guns to be taken through the national parks. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's they... Right. They, they have to be in a case, and uh, you can't take them out and shoot anything, but you can take them through a national park. And, uh, again, that became a, a rider on another bill, but I think everybody understood what we were, what we were voting on. Right, on that and, the, one. and the, the, the whole reason came up for that because you, you can't get from Cody, Wyoming, to Jackson, Wyoming without going through Yellowstone National Park or, I guess, driving around the world and 
<laughs> or or the quickest way from from Cody into Montana or Cody into Idaho or yeah yeah or so, yeah so in order to get a firearm for, through Yellowstone National yeah. Park you worked on yeah. legislation for a lot it's, of people the national park is a place to visit right. right but for people that live around the park I mean it's it's the pl- it's the path from point A to point B right it, it, it's a crossroads for that corner of the of those states and. Uh, uh, people need to be able to go through there. We ran in then after I got the, the the firearms taken care of, then I had to do archery because I, I didn't realize that people were concerned about that. And the biggest problem that I had with the archery was when we, when we did this uh, hotline, I had a whole bunch of people that were upset with it. When I went to see them, they said, well, it'd be okay if you disassembled the bow. So I had to explain to them that if you had a compound bow to reassemble it, you have to take it to a to an archery shop and have them use some pretty elaborate equipment to get it back together again. And but then spend a lot of time at the range, it, yeah. retuning and reciting it. And <laughs> oh yeah, 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 absolutely. It'd be, yeah. but they didn't realize that they're thinking about the the, the recurve, yeah. the recurve bows where you just take the string off. <laughs> Well, bend it a little extra and take the string off, and then it's not usable that way. Now, you can't take them loaded. That's the wording that I put in there. The, you can't take so, a loaded uh, a loaded bow. Loaded bow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to be unloaded. Oh, uh, okay. You know. okay. But if you got people that don't understand the difference between the recurve and the compound bows. and uh, Yeah, they're not going to understand <laughs> a loaded, loaded bow versus yeah. unloaded bow. Yeah. <laughs> so well, we... Uh, yeah, we we actually got that passed and signed into law too, and that that's really important because a lot of times people are going to archery contests all during the year. It isn't yeah. just during the hunting season, and uh, they need to trans transfer through the parks in order to get that done. Well, I've got so, the next one for you, by okay. the way. I uh, because one of the things I want to do, and I can't do it right now, is I want to do this epic trip. Where I go into the Absorca Range, uh, you know, through the thoroughfare into the thoroughfare, and then I pack raft Thoroughfare Creek down into Yellowstone Lake. But evidently, you can't pa- you cannot pack raft the the lakes. You can't raft on the lakes or rivers. Uh, not oh, lakes, in, uh, in, in uh, Yellowstone. In Yellowstone, the the creeks or so you'd uh, have to, rivers. Could you pull out before you got? Oh, well, no, you can't of, even do the creeks or right, rivers? Oh, right. okay. That's, I thought it was just a lake. That's what I understand. It's really putting a wrinkle in my epic adventure that yeah, will probably right. kill me. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we my are, wife doesn't want that loophole fixed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we looked at it, and Cynthia Lummis actually put in a bill that would allow kayakers to kayak in the park. Right. And uh, the reason that ran into controversy is some of the places that they would like to kayak are really inaccessible. And uh, in the park, every once in a while, there's an accident, and the rangers were concerned in certain places how they would never be able to retrieve the body or get somebody out who's injured and the cost that it would be involved in it. So, again, unintended consequences. Probably the bill could be redone so that it uh, it did limit it to some places that you couldn't go. I think the phrase is called yeah. assumption of risk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you would think. <laughs> you would think. Well, that that's that's kind of counter to what I'm seeing in the United States, where if anything happens to a person, they want to know who caused it and how much they will pay for the pain. And uh, I, I'm just sorry to see that that happening. No I, personal responsibility. I, I visited yeah. Australia and. Uh, went over to the ocean and there was this magnificent cliff that we looked down. And I noticed a guy that had kind of climbed down the cliff, probably about 20 feet. It had to be a free climb, had this huge rod and he was fishing off a little tiny ledge. And, uh, I said, how come he's allowed to be down there? I said, why not? (laughs) (laughs) I said, well, I'm, I'm also concerned that here's this big cliff and you don't, you don't have any kind of a barricade or protection here to keep people from falling off of it. And they said, well, they shouldn't be so stupid as to fall off. And I said, well, in the United States, we'd have some kind of a rule about how close they could come or have some kind of a fence or something like that. And they, they said, well, you, you have to understand we're, we're, we're not quite at the same um, level of 
being litigants as you are in the United States, yeah. and we hope we never get that way. So we've got an accountant <laughs> making fun of two attorneys. Yeah, that's what I. That's how I'm taking. That's how I'm taking it too. All right. So you're kind of that kind of attorney now. I, I am. No, I. Well, I defend the cliff. But <laughs> well, you know, I, I've tried to do some tort reform in the in the Senate before, and I've been surprised that almost all of the attorneys vote against it. Um, and in the Senate, usually there's about 58 to 60 attorneys out of 100. Mm-hmm. Um, for 14 years, there was one accountant. Now there's two. Yeah, yeah. You, you were the one accountant. I was the one accountant yeah, for 14 okay. years. But uh, I, I couldn't understand how both sides, because I know some of them represent the, the, you know, the companies that were being sued. And uh, then it occurred to me, in the Old West, when one attorney showed up, he starved to death. When two showed up, they both made a good living. That's right. You've got to have somebody to, to sue on the other side. I mean, well, how do you need defense? Unless you... Yeah, yeah. So, so you were, you were, for a long time, you were the only accountant in the Senate, and now you, you managed to find a, a buddy. But as an yes. accountant, you also had to, had to kind of work your way on a variety of committees, and eventually you landed on the budget committee. I have a budget and, and on the finance committee, I which is the one that does about taxes. That. You had just said... You, you know, it, when you were in the Wyoming legislature, that if, you know, if, if you have experience in an area, yes. you're over, you're you're over, you're biased, right? That's I think you said you're biased, and so you you you're can't suspect. Be, you're suspect and potentially biased, so you shouldn't be on that committee. Yet, as an accountant, I mean, we should have. Frankly, the budget committee should all be accountants. But how do you? <laughs> that's not how it works. That's though. not how it works. So, well, so how, how, yeah, how long were you in the Senate before you got on, on either the budget or the finance committee? The, the one well, that I, does the budget, I, one does taxes. I actually was on the budget committee from from the beginning. Oh, okay. But uh, people get confused with what the budget committee is. Mm-hmm. The budget committee sets some limits of spending, and uh, the appropriations committee actually gives out the money. Okay. And when the Appropriations Committee is giving out the money, they have to have 60 votes to give out the money. And to override the budget, you only need 60 votes. So consequently, our budgets usually last for about 40 to 60 days before they're changed. And that's something I'm working on now, trying to get some process reform so that we can actually get some control over our spending. As everybody knows, it's more fun to give away money than it is to cut money yeah or well, so explain the explain the budget process because i mean it's a it's an enigma in that most folks don't understand the difference between the budget and the appropriations they mainly deal with the appropriations because it's more fun to receive it yeah. and to get it but but how are those limits set up i mean is it is it congress creates it is it what's the president's involvement and how, how does it work well the president isn't involved it's set up for just the house and the senate to arrive at how much ought to be spent because the constitution says that Congress holds the purse strings. But the president uh, creates a, offers a budget, right? He, he comes well, up with he one. offers a budget, but I don't think anybody's ever voted for one. <laughs> so I'm, and part of my budget reform, I want to change the name of the budget committee because everybody, as soon as the president sends out a budget, which doesn't mean anything because we don't pay any attention to it. As soon as he sends one out, I will have hundreds of people from Wyoming come back to visit me because their pet project might have been cut in the president's budget. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to explain to them that I, when I do the budget process, I don't have any control over their specific program. I only set major limits for each of the areas, and uh, the people are supposed to stay within that. That's how we're supposed to have the control. I'm trying to change the name of the budget committee to the fiscal control committee and make the Appropriations Committee be the Appropriations slash Budget Committee. Because that's what everybody thinks that they're doing. And what we're doing, it doesn't have anything to do technically with what everybody would see as their their budget. Um, but I had Eli Bebout come back and testify before my committee. Mm-hmm. He's a member of the Wyoming legislature. He's a, yes, yeah. Pres- yeah. He's current yeah. president of the Senate, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he has, he has the been the president. Senate. He's the only one that's ever been the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. But at the moment, he's the chairman of the Budget Committee for the Wyoming legislature. So I had him come back and explain how Wyoming does things. And, of course, one of the things they were astounded by is that uh, Wyoming actually figures out what they're going to spend, how they're going to spend the money, and gather the money before they actually spend it. 
And they, and they figure out they're going to spend con- it for two years. Right, right. When they do it, they do it biennially. But uh, as an example, the construction for the Capitol. Right. Uh, they put the $3 billion away first and then did the construction. Mm-hmm. Most places would do a bond issue, borrow the money, and then pay it back over a period of time. The federal government doesn't do the bond issue. They just borrow the money and never pay it back. But uh, he he testified, and one of the things he talked about was the state's uh, revenue estimating group. And after the after the hearing, nobody ever mentioned Eli, but they said, you know, I came up with this great idea. We really ought to have some kind of a committee that figures out how much money we've got to spend. <laughs> so that doesn't exist in the no, it the doesn't. Senate. No, no, we don't start with how much we can spend. <laughs> Which you, <laughs> would, you would think we could calculate that. Well, you wouldn't believe some of the problems. One of the things I'm trying to get. Um, the Office of Management and Budget to do is to put together a list of all of the projects that we have, all the programs that we have. And the Office of Management and Budget is within the president's office. That's within the president's office, yeah. Right, yeah. Their their job is... So it's an executive agency, but it's really tight up next with the president's sort of office. Well, they're they're the ones that are actually supposed to see that what was said to be spent is actually the way that it's spent. Uh Uh-huh. But it, it just floors me that we don't even have a list of all the things we're paying for. Nobody knows. Nobody's assigned what jurisdiction it is, and nobody's interested in whether, as long as the money's being given away, they don't care if it's, you know. We don't have enough paper to print it on, that list. <laughs> yeah. you know? it, so there's, there's, it, no, there's no accounting. There's no accounting of, of how right. we're spending money. That's right. As a country. Well, they're, they're, generally there is. Yeah. You're yeah, terrifying well, me well, right we, now. We, we quantify <laughs> it by, based upon our, our, uh, our deficit spending. We, we look at it more of a... On the on the backside. Well, and and it really needs to be separated into revenue and expenditures. What we talk about is the deficit, which is the amount of expenditures that ex- exceed the amount of revenue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the things that really irritates me is when they talk about we shouldn't have done the Tax Cut and Jobs Act because that takes away revenue. Well, it took away revenue, but it allowed the revenue to be reinvested in the country. We have had a bigger uh, wage increase than we've had in decades. We have higher employment now than we've had in decades. And here's the really important thing. We have more revenue coming in than we've had in decades. A year ago, right after the, the first year after the tax cuts, we had more revenue than we'd ever had before. This year, we're exceeding last year's revenue. So the revenue is coming in. But you keep hearing about this deficit. It's because we're spending it three times as fast as it's coming in. You just can't do that. So how do you solve that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope that my budget process reform will will actually do that. Biennial budgeting would really help if we uh, had a little bit more time to actually take a look at what we're spending. Um, so if you can't get it to last 45 days under the current system and you want it to last for two years uh, as a budget, I mean, well, there's going to be some significant change. It is, and the appropriators don't like it because they like to be able to hand out money every year. Um, originally, I said, well, what we'd, what we'd do is divide it up into two halves. There are 12 actual, actual bills that we're supposed to do every year by October 1st when the new fiscal year starts. And uh, I said, what we ought to do is take the t- the six toughest bills and do them right after an election. These are appropriation bills? Appropriations yeah, bills. Yeah. And then do the six easy, it'd be appropriation and fiscal control all at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, so we do the six toughest ones right after an election. We do the six easiest ones before an election. Then I think we could actually get those done. But uh, I've I've backed off of that. Because first thing I've got to do is get us to get to biennial spending. And the reason is that right now, every year, at the end of the year, people try to spend up all of the what they've gotten before so that they can justify what they want to have next time. And uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office, which is a, a special office that... Uh, that estimates everything that we do on what the outcome's going to be, said that they thought that that would save 5% because they'd only spend up their budget once at the end of two years instead of twice. And when they spend it up, it costs about 5%. 
So that'd be an immediate savings that we could do if we just went to... 5% of the United States budget is a lot of money. Yes. Yes, it is. Another problem we've got, though, is a whole. if, if you ever get a bill passed, one of the things you want to do after, and it, it spends money, one of the things you want to do is make it mandatory. Uh, mandatory means nobody's ever going to look at it, nobody's able to stop it, and the money will go out no matter what, uh, assuming we have money, and if we don't, we borrow it. And that's where most of the deficit comes from. Um, some of the big ones that are mandatory, it goes to Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, um, military pensions, uh, federal pensions. Those are all mandatory. Federal health care, mandatory. Um, I keep telling people that right now we're spending uh, our interest rates 2.5%. If that interest rate went to the norm, which is 5%, all we'd be able to fund would be Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the national debt. You didn't hear me say education. You didn't hear me say defense. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. No, none of that. No. So uh -huh. we're trying to figure out how to do infrastructure now. And what we've been, what we did originally on infrastructure, of course, was... Uh, have a gas tax, which I prefer to call a gas user fee, because if you don't use the highways, you don't need the gas, and consequently you don't pay the tax. But if you're going to use them, somehow you've got to help pay for it. There has to be some source of revenue for it. And for a long time there was. That money is still taxed, but it hasn't increased since 1988. And there's been a lot of inflation since then. There's been a lot of uh, better mileage in cars since that time and of course they're electric cars who don't pay anything toward the highways but they use the highways and uh, it, it's a terrible word but uh, we have to have the revenue and so one of the things I'm trying to do is get everybody to match up what revenue there is with these mandatory funds that we have and contending that actually nothing should be mandatory unless it has a source of revenue sufficient to pay for it forever. Uh, of course, that would put almost everything under scrutiny again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's that's where it needs to be. We need well, to take a look at every one of these projects. Yeah, the infrastructure and the fuel tax conundrum you're describing parallels well with some of the other things we've talked about before in um, outdoor recreation and uh, since you know license sales on for you know, any sort of game species, fishing, things like that, in addition to firearm purchases go to, to, to fund a lot of the conservation and the outdoor recreation that we, we, well, we benefit Well, specifically, right? like the yeah. Pittman-Robertson Act. Right, yeah. You know, yep. is, is set up as a system where excise taxes come in to through a federal law, and then that money is distributed out to the states so based a, on a formula. It's a it's a some users fee. It's a some users fee. It's not all users. Yeah. It's not, the yeah. there's no, the backpackers aren't, unless they are also purchasing items that are related to it. But, you know, that, that doesn't go in. There's a lot of uses of our public lands that don't chip into uh, a tax fund that, that pays for the use the, or the wear and tear. Well, and that's one of the big debates, right? One of the big debates in the, the sportsman's community, the conservation community right now is around the land and water conservation fund. Right. You know, and right. that was just reauthorized. Mm -hmm. But now the conversation is around and it gets to this. Permanent it, reauthorization. It's, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not just permanent reauthorization. I think I think that has occurred, mm -hmm. but the f the guaranteed funding is the next piece. Yeah. So right now it it's been permanently reauthorized with a ceiling of nine hundred million dollars, but without the uh, associated guarantee of that money being there. And so the, now the next next ask is, you know, how do we know that we can fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund? So this kind of so, gets to some of what you're, well, see, you're talking about. That's this, this trend to saying, well, we want that to be a mandatory fund. Well, I, I think it ought to be a mandatory fund if there's revenue sufficient coming in for it. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't get revenue, it shouldn't be stealing revenue from the other things like Social Security. You know, we had a surplus of Social Security for many years because uh, there were more people paying into the fund than there were taking out. That has changed. Um, and every time that more money came in than was going out, what they did was put bonds in the drawer in exchange for that money and spent the money. Uh, President Clinton was very proud of having balanced the budget. 
I looked to see how he balanced the budget. He took the surplus from Social Security, added it as revenue that he had, and put bonds in a drawer to take care of the... Uh, that, that's how we wind up with uh, a couple trillion dollars worth of Social Security backlog, but no money to back it up. Um, we've got to we've got to start paying attention to what we're borrowing, and uh, and get it on on a more even even keel. Sort of the idea of how you'd manage your own household, right? <laughs> yeah. at a very fundamental <laughs> level. Yeah, yes. right? yes. yes. personal finance. Personal and, finance. And but. But the federal government has so many difficulties, for instance, this not knowing how many programs we're actually doing. So no committee is ever looking to see if some program that was approved before is actually producing anything. It's hiring people, but is the money ever getting down to the, the need that was addressed when the thing was proposed? We don't know that. We're, we're funding a lot of employees. And, of course, if you talk about eliminating any of these, the employees immediately round up a whole bunch of people to lobby against it to show how absolutely essential that it is. Um, but it's also a, a, a trend where people say, well, I haven't had a bill named after me, so I think I'll do a housing bill. Everybody's interested in housing for the poor. We have 160 housing programs administered by 20 different agencies. Nobody is specifying how they're supposed to work, what the goal is, or whether they are working. So I've, it's, so I've it's not all housing and urban development, huh? No, nope. <laughs> no, no. It isn't even under housing and urban development <laughs> huh. for a bunch of them. Uh, I've, I've taken a portfolio down to housing and urban development and said, why don't you consolidate some of the ones that are under you and then help me to get the rest of them under housing and urban development. And if we eliminate duplication, there's a lot of money that's saved by eliminating duplication because every time that you combine two organizations, uh, there's an administrator, several assistant administrators, several secretaries, and so on down the line that you don't have to pay anymore. And that money can actually go to what the project was supposed to do. And uh, so I, I, I'm a big advocate of trying to uh, get those 160 down to five. Mm -hmm. There are only five purposes for that money. And we ought to have five purposes and five programs and have them under one agency and have somebody saying what the goals are and checking each year to make sure that we're achieving those goals. And if we're not, figuring out why we're not or eliminating the program. Um, again, that's Wyoming common sense. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So I'm not advocating for for growing government here, but this really sounds like every agency could stand to hire a um, a Six Sigma process improvement black belt. Yeah, uh, right. You know, that's my my father in law did that for Boeing uh, and mm -hmm. then for Cabela's, and it was about yeah. going in and and finding those redundancies yeah, and duplications, yeah. and how do you you know, improve efficiency yeah. and you know, increase revenue to the company yeah. and you know it, well the the federal yeah. government's had this um, uh, last person hired has to be the first person fired and i i figured out that the reason the government grows is as soon as somebody is hired they have to expand their workload so that they need an assistant so that there's somebody else that goes before they go <laughs> and uh, i've done some checking and there are a lot of people out there that are doing work they're doing they're all working they're all working but a lot of them are working on things that don't make any sense. I had one young man come to me and he said, I shouldn't tell you this because I'll, I'll just get fired. But I'm doing a job and it doesn't produce anything and nobody ever looks at it and it's worthless. And uh, I took a look at it. And he was absolutely right. And uh, we eliminated the job and we got him a promotion. <laughs> huh. that's that's the kind of people we should be looking for you know that uh, the ones that sort through the chaff i had a, um, a high school principal come to me and say uh, my district is going to let me be back here for a semester to take a look and see where all of the forms that i fill out go and what happens with them and they let him do that and i just sent him down to the department of education every day and he followed those forms around, and when he was done, he reported back to me, and he said, you know, every one of those forms, there's somebody that looks at every single blank on there, makes sure that they're all filled in, make sure that they're all filled in with something that makes logical sense, and if it doesn't, they send it back and make them redo it again, and when they get it back, they check every one of those things off again, and when it's in perfect shape, 
they put it in a file drawer and nobody looks at it again. So through the education process, and I'm on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee here too, and appreciate the experience that I got in the Wyoming legislature on education. And we've eliminated a bunch of those forms. We're, we're working on higher education right now, uh, trying to do some of that. I got it done in uh, career and technical education. That's for getting people an education that want to work with their hands. And uh, so we got rid of a lot of forms there. There were some districts in Wyoming that didn't have career and technical education. When I checked with them why, they said, no, there's not enough money coming in for all the stuff we have to file. So we got rid of a bunch of stuff, and now more people are doing career and technical education. But it's it's tedious work, and uh, we got to have more people doing it. I got. Uh, I, I want to ask you one more question before we get. I, I know, um, Mike. I know you wanted to ask some some more hunting, fishing yeah, kind right, of questions. Yeah. But I yeah. had one, I had one other question. I'm just coming at this from the perspective of a. Um, from our listeners that might be in the hunting community or might work for uh, a, a nonprofit organization or even a state wildlife agency, and they're they're thinking about some of these federal programs that are important to them, mm-hmm. and you know, you're talking about the difference between budget and appropriations, and what what's the best way? for those folks to engage and to understand the, the best way to engage for advocating for the programs that they support. Um, you know, I, I think you'd mentioned something about uh, having, you know, when, when the president issues a, a budget and people are upset about cuts in that budget to their programs, you know, you say, yeah, that's, that's, that's usually that's, all the rage. That's, that's yeah, what it we, sounds like it doesn't matter. That's what everybody seems to, latch on to absolutely yeah that's and, when they that's when they flood us in in washington and so the real question is what should they latch on to um, and, and how should they engage in a in a productive way um to well, communicate they, their you know their priorities well, one of the things that i'd like for them to do is take a look at how much is federally spent in their area and yeah, how yeah, much their they, district their how state, much they yeah. get you know, is the money actually getting down to the solution, or are we using it all up on administration? Um, I'm I'm afraid that that's where most of the money's going, and uh, a few of the programs actually, you know, cut out a bunch of the middlemen and get the money to where it's supposed to go, and I see that as the most beneficial, and I I do have groups that come in to see me and uh, I usually do a little bit of research beforehand so that I know what. Uh, what they're probably going to ask about and how much money it is, because it's always about money. Well, not always, but mostly when after the president's budget, it's always about money. Um, I, then I look to see how much Wyoming gets. And I've, I've seen programs where they're in advocating for several million dollars. And uh, when I check to see how much Wyoming's going to get, they're going to get $20,000. I said, well, how do you spread $20,000 out across Wyoming? I said, well, is that all we get? I said, yes, that's all you get. They said, well, we could raise that amount. I said, well, why don't you? And we'll just eliminate that expenditure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm sure it's a dibbling amount like that for almost everybody. And the federal government doesn't give out money that they don't require paperwork for. The uh, law enforcement associations, uh, they, they get some different grant monies. And they have to have it audited. And one of the things they found is that they can't have it audited, of course, until the year ends. But then they're not allowed to spend any of the money for the audit. But the audit costs them money. <laughs> so they got to prepay for an audit that they don't get until later? Well, they can't prepay for it either. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they've got this dilemma of how do we, you know, how do we get it so that we're meeting all the requirements and not having to put some additional money out of our own pocket? Yeah. So, so it yeah. sounds it sounds like if um, as far as advocacy goes it is for you you want them to come in informed on how it impacts directly within your constituency right right and and also understand broadly where the where the implications are but it, it also sounds like you you are really interested in hearing specific anecdotal information that is endemic of the of, of an issue that can be addressed through legislation. You like to get the story about 
um, you know, the, the, the gentleman that came in and mentioned the, the sort of useless program and the elimination and he gets a promotion. Or the guy that comes in that says, I, I got my knives confiscated and that leads to legislation because you're, yeah. you're, you're a problem solver based upon well, those things. Actually, the, the, big, the biggest job that I found that I have is handling individuals' problems with the federal government. Um, I think I'm up to about 15,000 of those now that I've, I've done for... Someone writes you know, in and say, I've got a problem, and you're, you and your staff work to address it. Yes. Uh, you've done that, yeah, 15,000 different you, problems. You've, yeah. you've done that for... So uh, you may or may not remember, but my dad's company based here in Cheyenne had some issues with, uh, and this would have been 15 years ago, uh, Unicover Corporation had some... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had, 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 <laughs> uh, several times there have been problems with... For, once it was with the federal government competing Exactly. With, yeah, through the post offices and uh, and then uh, with, the, with the coins I've had. Of course, I've, I'm not even on the right committee for the coins, but I am fascinated by coins. I've gotten some bills done with coins. I was instrumental in the Sacagawea dollar. And uh, right now I'm trying to... Um, save us a little bit of money uh, by eliminating pennies. Now, for coin collectors, that's a terrible thing to say, but for the budget of the United States, it's a really important thing because every time you spend a penny, you spend a nickel of federal of federal money. It costs, it costs a nickel, a, yeah. It costs a nickel to make a penny. So <laughs> why would we... That sounds so federal government. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, but that was, that was for similar. a penny? Right, that was similar for the dollar too. On the Sacagawea, the, the cost was not the right. same. Right, a, a paper dollar. Do, a Sacagawea dollar is good for twenty-five years. Paper dollar is good for a year and a half, and they both cost about the same amount to make. And uh, of course, with the the coins, because there are coin, there are a lot more coin collectors than there are paper dollar collectors. Um, uh, the first year that we did the Sacagawea coin, the federal government made a billion dollars. Because there were a lot of those that went a lot more went into collections than are in a normal year, but we make it. We make a coin for twelve cents and we sell it for a buck. <laughs> uh, we're really fortunate. Ecuador uses American coins, and so they pay us a buck for a buck. <laughs> 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 Actually, they, there are, there is a way that other countries can use our money and get a special deal so that they get a discount on the coinage, but. Uh, uh, my daughter was in it. The reason I know that is my daughter was in Ecuador, and she bought something. And when she got change back, there was a Sacagawea dollar. And the person said, when they could see her looking at it, and they said, oh, no, that that's real money. And she said, oh, I know it's real money. My dad's the one that got that mended. <laughs> <laughs> But but she you'll was, get those she in was, change in the United States. Yeah. yeah, right. She was probably disappointed and wanted an Ecuadorian form of coin to take home. <laughs> <laughs> I could get those in the United States. Yeah. No, I think I think she was pleased with it. And if 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 the federal government would have actually bought into the dollar program, uh, people would have used them. You know, when you get change, if you got a dollar. If when you're making a federal purchase, if you need change, you ought to get. A sack of jewelry, a dollar, because yeah. it saves us money. Yeah, makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, we 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 started the conversation around your sportsman's caucus, and and you, I know you have a passion around, you know, hunting and fishing and all that, and you, you started that way as a kid, right? Oh yeah, my yeah. my my grandpa was largely responsible for it. Uh, yeah. Because he he took me everywhere and and did that with me and. Uh, what brought my family to Wyoming, uh, my dad was a welder during World War II in, in Bremerton Shipyards. And when the war was over, he became an itinerant welder. You know, you got to go where the work is. And one of the places that there was work was in Thermopolis. They were building the dam. And if you drive by that dam with me, I will say, my dad built that. <laughs> Actually, he welded a little on the spillway. Uh, and we're <laughs> talking it, Boysen Reservoir, the dam yes. at Boysen. Yeah, yeah yes. right before so, the for Wind folks. River uh, Canyon. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, uh, it it tamed the river, cleaned the river up, and made it one of the prime fisheries in the United States. If you float that canyon, you won't catch any little fish. Oh, that's no. a fact. You will no, catch a lot of fish. Big German brown in there. Gigantic yeah. brown trout. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you may even get a uh, whitewater rafting trip. In addition to your float trip, <laughs> your fishing trip. Uh, there are some parts of the canyon that will turn into white water for sure. Yeah. You have yeah. to put put your rod in a case and make sure your 
uh, life vest is fastened well <laughs> and, and hang on and you, you go through there. But uh, most of it is really, really nice fishing. Oh, uh, yeah. Beautiful. And the road parallels the river, but it's quite a ways down to the river most places. And steep. So mm-hmm. um, I'm back in Wyoming almost every weekend, travel a different part of the state, but I have my fishing stuff with me. And when I'm going through that canyon, part of my fishing stuff is a rope. And I tie the rope to the guardrail and lower myself down to the water and fish for my hour of allotted time before in, I move on to another in, appointment. In a suit and dress shoes. I, I was going to ask yeah. that. I'd heard rumors about the suit and dress shoes. And well, I'm, I, now I'm picturing you rappelling off the side of a cliff <laughs> down to the river in a suit. <laughs> well, it's not quite rappelling. I use yeah. the rope then to be able to climb well, back up again yeah, in my I, car when my allotted time so, is up. And I, I do take my coat off. My wife tells me that if I took my tie off too, that I'd be less recognizable. And uh, You'd have less you know. people stopping you to talk yeah. while you're fishing? <laughs> yep, yep. I'm, yeah. I'm one of the people who definitely fishes with a barbless hook, and it's not so that I can release the fish easier. Of course, I you know I can't take any fish with me anyway, so it is catch and release. And and a barbless hook helps with that, but it's because people, when I'm when I'm more accessible right by the road, uh, people kind of sneak up on me to let me know that they've got this little problem they'd like me to know about. And someday on the back cast, I'm going to catch one of them, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be able to get that hook out before the press gets there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you can't. Yeah, you have to catch and release because you're on the road all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We essentially work four days a week in Washington and three days a week in Wyoming. And, yeah. Uh, to get to Wyoming is, you know, 14, 16 hours round trip by air. And then in Wyoming, we usually drive maybe 500 miles on a weekend getting around to a lot of small towns as well as some bigger meetings. And uh, yeah, so, so it helps us to know what's going on and, and what kind of problems people are having. And I tried to get into a couple of businesses. Because I know from talking to people, I was in the shoe business for 28 years, and uh, anybody that hasn't been in the shoe business thinks it's pretty simple. Um, And that's the way we look at any business that we haven't been in, even the law business. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's simple. (laughs) So I try to learn a little bit about as many businesses as I can, because then when I'm back in Washington and one of these builds comes up, I can talk about some of the unintended consequences, particularly for small businessmen. Um, there's even less understanding of small businessmen. I'm working on some stuff for pharmacists right now that I had no idea happened. I have no idea how they ever keep track of how much money they're making. So a lot, a lot of problems out there to solve. But I, I do like my fishing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did grow up in, in Yellowstone. My grandparents went up there when it opened in the spring. They had a little camper trailer. Um, actually, it was a trailer, but... Today, it would be considered a small camper trailer. It was probably about 12 foot long. And uh, they, at that time, you could stay 15 days in the campground. And so they stayed, and there was there was a campground right at Fishing Bridge. And uh, they'd stay there for their 15 days, and then I'd help them move down to Three Mile Campground, which doesn't exist anymore either. And it's on the Yellowstone River. So I'd get to fish in Yellowstone Lake when they were up at Yellowstone Lake, and then I'd get to fish at Three Mile uh, in the Yellowstone River, my alternate trips there. Yeah. And I usually got to stay a little while for them, got some Boy Scout merit badges while I was there, hiked over a lot of the country. Hike, hiking and fishing for a month in the summer in Yellowstone. <laughs> Ter- sounds, a terrible child. Sounds rough. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Would, the, yeah. would that all kids could be raised yeah. with that, those kinds of experiences. Yeah. Now, I've, I've got to say, at that time, it wasn't catch and release. It was catch and eat. Uh-huh. Uh, you were allowed to catch three a day, and uh, as long as they were not in your possession, you could catch three more. Not in your possession meant processed. So we had fish for breakfast, we had fish for lunch, we had fish for dinner. My grandma smoked fish, she pickled fish, she canned fish. And, and you still like we the fish. We had fish all winter. <laughs> that's yeah. that's why you catch and release now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it not, well, has nothing to do with your travel schedule. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I learned to do was to fillet fish, though. And, you know, my family really likes it as long as all the bones are out. And uh, there's nothing quite like a Yellowstone cutthroat either, which people can't enjoy today because it's all catch and release now in the in the main cutthroat areas there. But uh, 
they there's a lot of freshwater salmon in the lake, and so they're as pink meated as salmon. They don't have any fish taste to them at all. Mm -hmm. it just it, it's a delightful fish which nobody will be able to enjoy. Hmm. And I think part of it is due to the 1988 fires, which caused a lot of erosion. Uh, we had the brucellosis problem in the, in the park, and I got to go investigate part of that and uh, actually went on a helicopter ride over part of Yellowstone in the spring um, so that we could look at the, the bison population. And actually it was at a time that some grizzly bears were just coming out of hibernation. It was marvelous. And, and to get to fly over something that you'd hiked over most of your life was just such a treat. Um, but it, it's, it's overpopulated with with buffalo and they're eating everything else out of house and home there. Uh, so something has to be done about it. And I think that's why wolves were introduced. They thought that the wolves would kill off the bison, but the bison are the most herd animals that there are when they, a wolf comes around, unless they're, you know, an old straggler out there, the herd forms around the cows and the calves and they'll kill any wolf that comes there. Uh, but moose are not a herd animal. Elk are not typically very much heard at the time that they're doing their birthing, so it creates some problems there. But um, I've gotten to I got to see Yellowstone in the spring. Hmm. Am I and allowed to give away a spot that you can catch Yellowstone cutthroat throat outside of the park in Wyoming? That's a phenomenal fishery that you can eat them, or should I not give that away? I probably shouldn't give that <laughs> well, away. We, we can we, we can, can do that off. Our, yeah, off I probably shouldn't give that away. All right. But I've eaten a lot of well, Yellowstone River cut throughout throat that I've caught um, outside of the park. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are a lot of places that they've been stocked and they're proliferating, and I'm I'm delighted with that, and uh, wouldn't wouldn't mind eating them either. Yeah. But no, you, they're, they're great. You don't just catch fish in in Yellowstone in Wyoming. You've got a you've got a deal. Where you're you have a goal. For more well, than one state, right? I, I do. Well, actually, I had I have a goal of a list of 100 things I want to do, but one of those is to fish in every state. Uh, I, I didn't wipe out 50 by saying that. I, I yeah, just yeah. One Your goal. list of 100 things includes one goal that says catch a fish in every state. Yeah, and, and when I fish in a state, then I put it on my done list. When I'm having a bad day, I can look at my done list and say, nah, it's not too bad. So how many states are you up to? I'm at 26 now. 26. So I finally got good. halfway it slowed down dramatically when I when I got this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah. I've, I've enjoyed fishing my, my whole life. When I was growing up, I had a 1948 Willys Jeep station wagon. And the neat thing about those is inside where the wheel is, uh, it goes up at an angle, and then it's level for ways, and then it goes back down again. And that makes a phenomenal rest for a 4x8 piece of plywood it has to be trimmed a little bit, but it'll fit in there and make a bed. And under the bed, you can fit three drawers. And in one of the drawers, you've got your fishing equipment, of course. And in another one, you've got your camping equipment. And in the third one, you've got your food. <laughs> so you had a Willie's Jeep where you, you fashioned a little uh, drawer system for, for fishing. Yep. So you can yep. sleep so out of it, fish out of it, I, yep. live out of it. When yeah. I finished working on the weekend i jumped in my jeep and went up in the bighorns and drove into some places and in, in the dark that uh, when i came out on sunday in the daylight i said wow this is pretty scary <laughs> <laughs> had no idea i was at this long big of an angle overlooking a cliff you know? <laughs> i even had uh, one trip when i came out of a place and there was a guy that had a regular car and he'd gotten it in further than i ever thought he should have gotten it in and he was still about 10 miles from the fishing. And uh, so he, he offered me some money to give him a ride in there. And I said, what I just came out of, I will never go back into again. <laughs> <laughs> you can't offer me enough for that. <laughs> and uh, um, on, on places to fish, um, I have some friends that like to climb. And so I've gone with them when they've gone to climb. And I go with them as far as the last place that I can fish. <laughs> and I stay there and fish until they come back from their climb. That sounds like the right way to do it. Oh, yeah, I've right. got, gotten to see some, some marvelous, marvelous places with that. Um, I understand, I mean, 
so you enjoy fishing, but I understand you do, you've done a fair amount of hunting in your day too. Um, I don't get to do that very much because unlike catch and release, you, you get some kind of game animal. It takes you a long time to process it, to get it home and to make sure that it's yeah. going to be edible. He, he only gets 15 minutes to fish when he can. He's not going to get 15. <laughs> right. No, I was hunt. saying, yeah. but, but right. I, I was saying yeah, in, but, in, but back in the day, back in the day, you did yeah. a fair amount of hunting. Oh, yeah. And grew up I, hunting with your, your dad and your you grandpa? Couldn't, you couldn't do yeah. big game hunting until you were 14 when I was growing up. But, Same here. Yeah, but you didn't have to have uh, hunter safety at that time. Uh, yeah. But I'd been going out with my grandpa when, from when I was four when he'd sight in his rifle. And uh, there was this one, his, his favorite rifle was the thirty out six, an old Springfield rifle that he'd sporterized. He cut off the front, the stock used to go clear to the front of the gun. He cut that off so it looked modern. And then he put a little blast defector on the end so that it kicked about a little more than the 22, but not much more than that. Four power scope on it, not adjustable. <laughs> We'd go out and sight that in every year and he'd he'd take three shots and, and uh, at a target and he'd say, now that's gonna be six inches high and six inches to the right. And Mickey, when you inherit this gun and it's six inches high and six inches to the right, do not change the scope. If you ever change that, it will never stay in the same place. This one always stays in the same place. So years later, I got invited to the one-shot antelope hunt. Now, my grandfather thought that was the greatest sporting event in the world. He knew every year who got invited to the one-shot antelope hunt, and he knew who got their antelope. And uh, But he he knew he was never getting invited. It's kind of a... A celebrity hunt. Uh, there's eight teams of three people, and that's it. And uh, uh, I got an invitation to get together a team of three, and I, and I and I did. And when I went to that, in honor of my grandfather, I took that thirty out six <laughs> in its original case, which I've got to say is a little bit. Uh, uh, it, it's old. And it's a vinyl case, so the case is chipped up a little bit, and still protects the gun nicely <clears throat> and uh, when you go to the one shot antelope hunt there's a day that they sight in the rifles before you go out into the field the next day and they have a bunch of professionals there that uh, are willing to you know do whatever needs to be done to the rifle to make it work perfectly and most of the people on these teams are coming from big cities and and they've bought new guns with these fantastic scopes and stuff and they really do need them sighted in and uh so when it was when it was my turn I unzipped the case and pull out <laughs> the guides actually applauded that I had this old rifle. <laughs> and I went down to the shooting bench and the the gunsmith was there and I said, Now, when I shoot this it's gonna be six inches high and six inches to the right, and if it is, you're not changing it. He said, Okay. <laughs> So you shoot, and then there's some people that lower the target down, and then the report back how it is. They said six inches high and six inches to the right, <laughs> <laughs> dialed in. <laughs> I said I can put the next one in the middle. He said okay, I did, <laughs> <laughs> and I used that gun to get my get my antelope, and I I got it with my one shot, um, and I I I swear that uh, as I was getting ready to shoot that antelope. I could hear my grandpa saying, now just squeeze the trigger and you won't miss. <laughs> now, one time when I was deer hunting with him, I did miss. <laughs> and for the next year, I heard about that. <laughs> he said, you won't miss if you just squeeze the trigger. <laughs> if you don't squeeze the trigger, you raise that about an eighth of an inch at the end. And by the time it gets out there 200 yards, it's two feet high. I don't know whether his math was correct or not, but <laughs> I heard the story often enough. <laughs> Good thing Nephi's not here. He would have just gone through an entire ballistics lesson. Oh, well, yeah, right, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Is that the same, yeah. uh, same rifle you used on, on the moose? No, I took that rifle along. But, yeah. But uh, they're, they're a little bit bigger animal, and uh, I wasn't sure how far away I would be. So for, for most of the hunt, I had the 30 out, that 30 out 6 with me, but... Uh, I also had a backup gun, and when I started tracking one through the willows, I thought maybe a little more firepower would be good. So yeah, I, I took yeah. more firepower, and it was a good thing. I uh, 
I shot my moose at probably about 12 yards. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and he wasn't yeah. very happy. <laughs> yeah, I bet not. Yeah, you shot your elk last year at about 12 yards. It was about 12. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, the, the interesting part of that is when you look through the scope at a moose at 12 yards, all you see is black. Right. You Where do you put the bullet? Right? You know that you know, with elk, it's, to him it's to brown. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that. I Because when I raised my scope up this year, I just, all I saw was brown, and I guessed. Uh, I was like, I think this is over the shoulder. <laughs> you guessed wrong. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. The first well, you shot, hit it three times. I did every every time I hit <laughs> every it. Every time you hit it, it yeah, got twice as far away every time from <laughs> from ten yards to twenty, and 20 yeah. I guess twenty to thirty. But, yeah. So so you but this you, one dropped pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah. did you did now did you have it down at your side? Is that how you really did it, or did you raise yeah, the scope? I, up? I actually had to take it away from my eye. I yeah. I had no idea what I was looking at through the scope. And yeah, I'm I'm not smart. I've never to done do that. any close shooting with a scope before, so you do, no, you don't I, do close shooting with a scope. I lowered it down. I could see exactly where I was pointing it. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, this you didn't uh, you didn't just happen to get a, a moose tag like you. How how long did it take I, for you to get that tag? I think about fifty years. Fifty uh, years of yeah. I was putting in for moose for a long time, and then I was in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And I heard about a point system. So I helped on a bill that instituted the point system so that every year that you put in and you don't get drawn, you get more points. And they've got to start with the people with the most points and work their way down. Yeah. And uh, But it's got to be fair. You can have a random one in there. There's points and then well, there's random, right? Evidently, that never was for me because I never was able to win a drawing. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> Even a, when it was wide open, I couldn't win a drawing. I know a guy that, that drew a moose tag. um Less than than two tenths of one percent chance. Yeah, I had I drew yeah. it in, in after six years of trying on the yeah. random, and our uh. last podcast was all we about yeah, that. We just covered yes. it. so, but so fifty years. <laughs> well, I after I after I put in this point system and irritated game and fish, uh, they also came out with the lifetime fishing licenses, and one of my questions was. Um, how will you know that there will be money to provide me with fishing for a lifetime? And they said, oh, we'll just spend it as we get it. I said, I don't think so. So they're allowed to spend 10% of the revenue from it each year. And uh, um, I think there was a sign down in the Game and Fish that said, whatever Enzi puts in for, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I took it. I had, as somebody... My son has the same last name, and he'd put in too, and we'd both put in for elk areas that had lots of tags and anybody we ever knew that put in for those areas got their elk tag we didn't <laughs> well as the person that represented the game and fish department for a number of years i was their legal counsel for a number of years oh um yes that's exactly what we did <laughs> <laughs> well i always suspected it <laughs> yeah of course i did get to tell governor friedenthal because I, I drew mine the year after he was the the governor i said change of administration made a difference in my moose license <laughs> <laughs> said well i didn't make one in mine i didn't get mine <laughs> uh he was delightful he was the uh you, you don't hunt with somebody from your own team when you're in that one shot antelope hunt. You have to hunt with a different hunter from another team. And so I was I was teamed up with the governor. And uh, we got out there a little bit early, so we had a cup of coffee and we're visiting. And he said, you know, if I miss mine, I'm going to say I had a Republican bullet. And I said, they're all Republican bullets. You don't, your side doesn't even believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> he used that later that night, although he didn't miss. Um, but uh, yeah, fun stories out of that. That yeah, those are fun stories. Um, yeah, I and I bet you have about a million more. Um, but I was going to say you're a really busy man, but you're on recess right now. And if it's like my kids, there's just nothing going on. Mm. <laughs> I hate to call them recess though i call it a work period i know i know well, I did. that was more tongue-in-cheek because I, I think people we'll get... don't realize how much work you do on the recess I, well I, and people don't realize that i've seen you up work until one in the morning i, I do my best work in the middle of the night all, all, <laughs> almost every night yeah regardless of in session or not yeah. seven days a week it's a quiet time at that time of night so i can get a lot done and i one of the adventures of this job is all the different things that you learn about of course that's also one of the challenges all the things that you've got to learn about uh, 
when I went to the legislature, I thought I'd just have to vote on the municipal issues. And of course, I quickly realized that you have to vote on all of them, which means you have to learn about all of them. So there's just, um, I think I get the equivalent of a, a college course every month with this job. And mm -hmm. It's so fascinating. You, you, read, you read all the bills. Uh, up, yeah, I read the bills and a lot of stuff about them. Now, you, you don't yeah. just rely on staff to tell you what it is. You you read them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In in addition to reading. Now, occasionally they dump them on us a little bit late, and yeah. there's like forty two hundred pages, and uh, forty eight hours to read it in, and that's total time, not that right. Yeah, sleeping yeah, time. Yeah. So I have to have a lot of help when it gets sure. When but, it gets to but, those. But to so your credit, I've got you, good you, staff. You are a speed reader, though. You read yes. how many books a, a week? Do you read? Oh, it it, it varies depending on what my workload is. But I read about a hundred books a year. Okay, so about, and about ever since yeah. graduate school, I've been doing a book report on every one of them. So it it saves me going back and rereading. About half of them that I read have something to do with what I'm working on. Yeah, the other half are, I'd say, purely enjoyment. Although. The professor that started me on doing these book reports said, if you read a book, even a novel, and it doesn't give you an idea, you wasted your time. So even when I'm reading a novel, I'm looking for something in there oh. that, that might be a nugget of an idea. And it it's amazing. They, there are different learning points, even in, in some of the regular reading. And I, I try to read something that has nothing to do with my job before I go to sleep. Otherwise, I work on it all night. I wake up during the night. I have these great ideas. I wake up in the morning and I can't read anything that I wrote down. Although I started doing that on my phone now so that I'm typing it. So it is readable in the morning. And sometimes they're pretty good. But <laughs> the biggest thing that keeps me up now is the, the national debt, trying to solve that. My wife will see me sitting on the edge of the bed in the middle of the night and say, so are you sick? And I'd say, no, I've just got to solve this problem. Just can't understand it. Can't sleep. So, well, to take your I mind, get my book out and read something that has nothing to do with the budget, and I can go back to sleep. Well, to take your mind off the budget for just a couple of minutes, let your mind wander someplace else, maybe more pleasant uh, than than our current situation. I got to ask you one last question here. Okay. So, on this podcast, we always ask our guests, "What's?" your mountain, as in what's that place that's so meaningful or special to you or holds a special place uh, in, in your heart. It can be a, a philosophical place. It can be a physical place. It can, you know, but, but it's, this is the Your Mountain podcast, and we want to know. Yeah. What gives you that energy? What, what yeah. brings you joy? Yeah. Well, what, actually, what's your mountain? Yeah, actually, actually, my mountain is what gives me relaxation between the times that I'm tense and, and worked up and, and trying to solve things and and meeting sometimes with people that I'd rather not be meeting with, trying to come up with a, a solution or what we can leave out in order to, to get something done. So um, fishing, fishing is my release. Although um, recently I was on, I got to do a little float trip and uh, it was, it was a marvelous float trip. But afterwards, my son was talking to the guide, and the guide said, I have never seen anybody so intense when they're fishing. They're just, I mean, he is concentrating on that. He's making great casts. He's catching fish. And Brad said, I hate to tell you that, but that's when he's relaxed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, so I want to, I want to thank you for, sh for sharing so much with us. I want to thank you for all that you do for, not just for, Wyoming and the citizens of Wyoming, uh, because I've been personally impacted through my family by the work that you do. I have a great appreciation for what you do. Uh, but beyond that, you know, what you're doing for the country and the sacrifices you've had to make to give up some of your greatest passions in, in hunting and fishing, to be able to catch a cast here and catch a cast there when you can between, I mean, you're just giving your entire self to service to the country and to the state and and just so appreciate what what you've done in the career that you've you've given to the people. Um, and then I also well, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing some of these stories. Well, thanks. I appreciate uh, being here and getting to visit about a whole range of things that I hadn't thought about a lot for a while. Um, but I and I do appreciate uh, 
um, all of the things that I've gotten to do, the adventure, the uh, people that I've gotten to meet. Um, one, one thing that I'd probably, when I'm out there, I get to meet a lot of people. And every once in a while, one says, I know this really great place to go fishing. I'd like for you to go with me. And I said, oh, I am booked up for the next month. You know, and I don't know if I can be back here at that time. So I'm just hoping that all those people that have suggested that they've got a place that I could fish will remember it after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll direct them all here and we'll get everybody to listen yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm keeping a list. <laughs> when, I, when I was mayor of Gillette, uh, I had to negotiate with all these companies and stuff. And every once in a while, I remember there was one that had this big salmon fishing trip in Washington. And they invited me on it. And I said, you know, I, I don't think it'd be right for me to go because, you know, we're in these negotiations and stuff. And it it had looked bad at the best. So I turned it down. When I was through being mayor, I got a hold of them and I never got to go on the fish. Trip. Yeah, that's how that <laughs> of course, works. So I must have been right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, I'm yeah. sure somebody's gonna uh, gonna you know, honor that offer, you know, and I'm yeah. sure many people were uh, will be honoring that offer. I imagine you'll yeah. get a lot of good fishing in in the future. Yeah. Uh, and for everybody else out there that's listening, thanks for listening. Go out where you get this podcast. Give us a rating. Leave us a review. Um, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that yet. Send us an email if you've got topic ideas, your mountain at itsyourmountain.com. Find us on all the normal social medias with our handle at itsyourmountain. And as always, please remember that life is about experiences, so go have one. <laughs>